computational methods in chemistry. Um, this is really a, a subject that is uh, interdisciplinary in the sense that it brings together um, physics and chemistry and mathematics and computer science all under one umbrella, if you will. The topic is as old as uh, the laws of physics um, are themselves. I mean, it goes back all the way to uh, the formulation of the laws of classical mechanics by Sir Isaac Newton. So that brings us back to, uh, I guess, the, the 16th century. You know, at, at that time, what people were interested in was predicting the specific motion of celestial bodies. So they wanted to know how to find the trajectories of, of planets uh, and stars and things under the action of the gravitational attractive forces that, um, that govern their, their motion. Well, it was discovered in the mid 20th century, uh, I would think about the late 50s, that those very same laws that govern the motions of planets and stars and even galaxies, generally celestial bodies, could also be applied to the microscopic world with some strong caveats about you know, th these being uh, approximate. But they could be applied there to uh, tell us about the motions of atoms and molecules. So the very same laws that govern the motions of very large things could also then be applied to tell us about the motion of very small things. Right? The difference is that in the case of celestial bodies, planets and such, we know what the basic law of, uh, of action is. So we know what the forces are. These are going to be the forces of gravitational attraction. At the level of atoms and molecules, the forces are rather more complicated. There are a variety of forces that uh, act. They're all of an electrostatic nature. So what that means is that when you go to the microscopic world, the, uh, the force laws are governed by um, rules that are attractive if two charges are unlike, and they're repulsive if the charges are alike. So when we have charged nuclei and electrons, these are the kinds of forces that we have to deal with. And these are often then turned into effective forces that uh, give rise to a weak type of uh, attractions, what we call van der Waals interactions, and stronger attractions that give rise to you know, things like hydrogen bonding, and then very strong attractions that actually lead to chemical bonding. And all of these forces must be described within uh, our laws of motion. So what we do is we create effective models for these forces, and then we use them uh, in the, the laws of physics, or Newton's laws, to tell us how the atoms in the molecules move around, and therefore they will give us the, the motion of the molecules uh, themselves. So when we do that, um, of course we can't get exact solutions to the equations of motion because they are very, very complicated, but we can do this using computational techniques. So computers actually allow us to generate solutions to these uh, laws of motion. Well, what we do then is we take the laws of motion and we simply come up with an algorithm for discretizing them. All right? So in time, which is what the laws of motion are giving us, they're giving us the motions of atoms and molecules in time. What we do then is we discretize uh, these equations in time and then we allow a computer to generate these approximate solutions. And they will tell us about all sorts of processes and that happen in the microscopic world. They'll tell us about, in principle, chemical bond breaking, so we can actually get chemical reactions. They'll tell us about uh, how uh, complex systems such as proteins and nucleic acids, which are important in biology, how they fold into their uh, biologically relevant conformations. They'll tell us about um, complex uh, membranes, for example, of industrial importance, things that go into batteries and fuel cells, how they'll uh, fold into their chemically active conformations. They'll tell us about things like how small molecules move around, so um, how small molecules might diffuse in biological systems, 
uh, and a whole variety of, of interesting processes uh, like this. And all of this is encoded in these laws of motion. Well, usually the systems that we want to study are sufficiently complex that we need very large computers in order to do our, our calculations. You know? So um, many of the computers that we use are uh, uh, high performance computing platforms. They use, um, or they uh, uh, have many, many, many um, uh, processors operating in parallel. And uh, we let them simply uh, operate on the, the, the laws of motion. And then we can handle systems consisting or well, typically of maybe millions uh, or even ten million, tens of millions um, of atoms, which is large enough that we can start to approximate real systems, but of course small on the scale of what you might consider well, actual macroscopic matter. Nevertheless, what we get from this uh, type of calculation is still relevant and can, get, and can give us properties that can actually be measured uh, in experiments, which is really what we want to do. We want to be able to uh, predict the results of experiments that may yet be performed, or we want to be able to rationalize the results of experiments that uh, have been performed and try to understand them from the point of view of this microscopic detailed motion. So there are, there are important approximations that we are making when we assume that the basic classical laws of motion can be applied at uh, the microscopic level. The most important one, and this is an important one, is that really at the level of atoms and molecules, the laws of quantum physics really govern what's going on. And when we use the laws of, uh, of Newton, the, the classical laws of motion, well, we're neglecting the, uh, the quantum effects that are there. So that is a, a severe approximation. It's one that can be corrected for uh, with techniques that are not unlike what one use in, uses in, uh, when applying the classical laws of physics, but they effectively incorporate uh, quantum effects that we're, we're missing. Right? So that's something that we always have to be aware of, that we're making this approximation that the laws of classical physics apply rather than the laws of quantum physics. But once we accept that, that approximation, then um, we can turn all this microscopic data that we get, which is really at the level of having the time-dependent trajectory, so the exact motion of every atom that we're studying in our system. And we need to turn that into something that can actually be measured in an experiment. So we need to turn that into what we call an observable. The way we do that is to use the rules of something called statistical mechanics. Statistical mechanics is an area that is applied in, throughout physics and chemistry and even biology uh, to connect all this microscopic detail that we have, all these, these time-dependent trajectories of, of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of, of atoms in our system into real observables. What it says basically is that you can um, uh, attach to all this motion a specific statistical distribution, all right, a very, typically a very simple one, and then you can express any observable that you might be interested in as an average over such a distribution. And using those rules, we can turn all this microscopic motion into an actual physical quantity that we might uh, want to measure. A very simple example would be to turn the, uh, uh, let's say, all the, 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 the velocities of all the atoms into something that you might measure, which would be the temperature of the system. Now, that, that can be done simply by computing an average of the, uh, the squares of all those velocities times their masses, which is a measure of the kinetic energy. And that connects directly to temperature. So temperature, which is something you can get just by putting a thermometer in your system, can be obtained simply by doing this kind of average over the velocities. So other things that we can obtain from all this microscopic motion might include, for example, uh, the pressure of the system, which is something you can easily measure. Um, we might want to get things like entropy or the enthalpy uh, or just average energies. 
Uh, we might be interested in dynamical properties that would include rates of diffusion, uh, rates of chemical reactions, uh, various vibrational properties. All of these things are available to us through the application of the laws of statistical mechanics to all of this underlying motion that we get from our computer simulations. I should mention, of course, that molecular dynamics, which is this technique by which we're solving the Newtonian equations uh, numerically, um, there is an alternate way to get statistical properties uh, and uh, observable properties. And it's through a method known as Monte Carlo, which is another very popular approach. Um, again, like molecular dynamics, Monte Carlo was an approach that uh, originated you know, maybe around the mid 20th century or so. And the idea here is that instead of, instead of using the statistical distribution to turn the, the microscopic trajectories into observables, we actually work directly with that distribution and we create samples from it. So the way that's done, and hence the name Monte Carlo, is that it's done through what we call games of chance. Well, the idea here is to use random numbers and a particular model game of chance to create um, samples, direct samples, from this statistical distribution that you're interested in. You create these samples, and what they, these samples then are are microscopic configurations. So in other words, they would be configurations that are the positions of every atom in your system, for example, or every molecule in your system. You choose the level of coarse graining that you want, and then the rules of Monte Carlo give you these configurations. Then you can perform direct averages over these configurations in much the same way that I just described, and turn those also into uh, the observable properties of the system. Now, where the, the field is now is, of course, we have very good models for uh, the interactions between atoms and molecules in the system, so we can model these things reasonably accurately, but there is a better way to do it than using effective models. These models um, tend to describe, in very simple ways, chemical bonding, and they tend to describe uh, sort of very localized motions of atoms and molecules. For example, if I have three atoms connected by two chemical bonds, then there might be a, a bending motion between them. And if I have four atoms um, connected by chemical bonds, then there's going to be a sort of torsional motion between them. All these various things can be described by very, very simple models uh, for these types of interactions. But a much better way to treat this kind of problem, to, to obtain these interactions, is to use the rules of quantum mechanics. And I said that we approximate the system with the laws of classical physics, but where the, the forces come from, if we don't want to use a model, is we can use a level of quantum mechanics that separates the electrons from the nuclei and says, well, we know that electrons are basically the glue that holds atoms together into molecules. It's electrons that are responsible for chemical bonding. It's electrons that are responsible for weak interactions, such as uh, van der Waals forces and things like that. So the alternate way then is to treat the electron distribution and the quantum um, electronic structure problem directly and solve that problem, and then from the solution of that problem, obtain the forces between nuclei directly from this electronic structure. When you do that, you're doing something that's called a first principles, or using the Latin phrase ab initio, molecular dynamics, which means from first principles. What this kind of model can describe that many of these other effective models can't is actual chemical bond breaking and forming events. So you can really do chemistry this way. Um, and, of course, the other thing that you get from this is uh, the, change, the changing distribution. So you get a, a, a way of describing the interactions that's sensitive to the local environment and how that local environment changes as atoms and molecules change their configurations as they move around. And this is actually important for having um, a higher degree of accuracy in the model, and also to be able to predict things without having to have the benefit of a model that may have certain parameters that you need to adjust according to 
the experiments that you're trying to mimic. Right? So this actually gives you a way to model the, the system in a way that's independent of the experiment and then to predict something that you might not have experimental information about. In other words, to be able to predict the results of an experiment that is yet to be done. So with effective models, I may have mentioned that you can do systems on the order of thousands, tens of thousands, even millions, millions of atoms. But if you use this first principles approach, then you're sort of limited to systems on the order of maybe a hundred atoms or so, which is considerably smaller. At the same time, the kinds of time scales that you can reach with these effective models may be on the order of um, uh, microseconds or milliseconds if you have a very good computer or you know, depending on the complexity of the system, maybe nanoseconds, so 10 to the minus 9 seconds. If you use this first principles approach, you're limited typically to maybe about um, 10 to the minus 12, what's called a picosecond, up to perhaps 10 or even 100 picoseconds at most. So where the field wants to go, of course, from here is to be able to have algorithms that are effectively able to uh, obtain these interactions from first principles more efficiently and, of course, to uh, take advantage of, of emerging hardwares, uh, graphical processing units and very large-scale parallel computers, to be able to extend both the time and the length scales so that we have the ability to predict um, the, these results on larger systems more accurately for longer times. The longer the time we can get, the more interesting processes we're able to, um, uh, to mimic. <laughs>